I will not be a fixture in my own house. I, I, I refuse to be something for you to set down and neglect until you have one of your brutish friends over and then be a subject of false pride, as if you care about me, as if you love me. Or with others, like that dreadful man, Craig, I think that's his name, as a point of humor, as if you mean to mock me and our relationship, I, I am not a clown. I'm tired of sitting around here doing nothing while you go out and live your life. I am sick, do you hear me? Sick of this, this inanimation. You have consigned me to this house as if it is my prison while you go out with your friends night after night, returning only when I've fallen asleep and waking well before I do. You avoid me. You put me away and hide me. Are you ashamed of me? Do you wish me gone? What, what is it? Why? Why can we never spend time together beyond those occasional, and that's a generous determination, times of extreme lust during which you handle me crudely and almost cruelly always with an expression of intermingled shame and dismay, as if I am merely serving a bestial, repugnant purpose. And you'd rather have someone else with whom to make love. Shaking, lying weakly upon the easy chair, I closed my eyes and tried to think of happier thoughts. Of some moment of romantic bliss that we'd shared together. Conversely, I heard him pace around, agitated, most likely trying to come up with a response that was placating, disarming. After a while, his aimless footsteps ceased, and I opened my eyes. He stood before me, hands at his sides, his face set in a solemn expression, as if he'd thought of something unmentionably grave. Fear suddenly entered my heart, and my body stiffened. I sensed a change in the atmosphere of our living room, an invisible current born of some funeral wind, and I tried and failed to smile affectionately at him, wishing that I could recant my tirade. I am truly sorry for this. These words chilled me incredibly and I felt myself sink deeper into the gently accommodating fabric of the chair. His eyes, ordinarily soft and blue, seemed in that moment blackened. Two spherical windows of a soul which had in that fateful moment changed, becoming shaded by darkness. I am sorry, you must realize. I never thought that this would happen, that you'd... you'd be so desirous of life with me. I never foresaw things becoming so... intimate. Oh. His words struck me like a lance, piercing my chest and obliterating my quickening heart. Sorrow. Sorrow overcame me. And I screamed out wailing nonsensically, replete with anguish. He watched me silently, and I'm sure, as sure as I've ever been, that beneath his immediate shock at my response, there was a humor that lurked beneath, a barely contained smirk just behind his mustached frown. You're a monster. It was all I could manage. I blubbered it out pathetically, like a frightened and stupidly sobbing child, and then closed my eyes, no longer able to bear the suggestion of that barely concealed expression of mockery. And then I felt his hand close around my throat. I tried to scream, but the pressure was too great. And opening my eyes, I saw again that shadowy tinge of his own, a swelling darkness which bespoke a ill intent toward me. Roughly silenced, I could only plead with my eyes. My arms were strained across myself by his other hand. He was a big man, much stronger than I am. 
In that moment, I felt true, soul-sinking helplessness. I'm going to put you in a box. His hot breath was a slap to my face. The words, droplets of ire, almost seemed to burn me. I cried, my voice barely a murmur with my throat so brutally seized by his hand. In what couldn't have been more than a light exertion of strength for him, he raised me from the chair and brought me crashing down onto the floor. As if thinking that I was somehow still in control of my faculties, despite my lolling head and lack of resistance, he slammed me down again, and I cursed the fact that I had such a thick skull. I wished for the bliss of unconsciousness, and it didn't come and I was made to feel the throbbing agony of my body's collision with the hardwood floor. Dazed, limp-limbed, I stared at the ceiling, at the fan languidly turning there, at the dull and peeling eggshell wallpaper I'd begged him countless times to replace or at least mend. When he stepped into view, a solid, imposing thing, I think I croaked out some plea for mercy, I can't remember those few moments from which I was nearly delirious from the pain. My head stopped swimming halfway through the hall, and I realized that he'd been dragging me away from the living room. Too weak to fight back, I only whispered out apologies, stupidly blaming myself for his cruelty. He, of course, ignored me, kept on dragging me roughly upon the floor, until we finally reached the guest room at the very end of the corridor. He slid me across the floor towards the bed where I came to a sudden and jarring rest against the low-lying bed frame. He left the room for a moment and I scanned my surroundings which seemed to stir and blur before my eyes. I recognized only vaguely the shapes of dressers, potted plants, and lamps. The sound of an object being set on the floor nearby snapped my attention back to the center of the room and I saw him seated just beyond the bed, a large wooden box across his lap. My heart sank at the sight. He wasn't speaking dramatically at all when he said that he was going to put me in a box. Still, I couldn't move. My disorientation both mental and physical. He set the box onto the bed and then lifted me up and placed me across his lap. His eyes, a little less hateful but still fierce, stared into mine. For a moment, I hoped that my face would inspire some mercy in him, that some recalled memory of romantic fondness would make him change his mind and spare me. But these hopes were blasted away when, after kissing my forehead, he stood and laid me in the box. I began screaming again, wildly, fairly, timber unlike anything I'd ever heard before. But he ignored me. And after, he fumbled around beneath the bed, retrieved an object, the box's lid. Rather than immediately placing it onto the box, he set it across his lap and scooted his chair closer to the bed. I stopped screaming, both out of tiredness and a grim curiosity. It was obvious that he planned to say something before sealing me inside. I don't really know how to explain it. When I first met you, I had only one intention in mind. I'm sure you can guess what that was. And as the weeks went by, that's all I thought about in regards to you. But then, when my luck elsewhere continued to fail, I started regarding you as something more. And I started treating you accordingly. But now, well, I found someone. She's great, really great. And I won't be needing you anymore. I know I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have kept you around for so long, but I was so lonely. And a man has needs. Even though his words stung my heart, as if a wasp's nest had been sewn into my chest. I was all cried out. 
and I only managed to whimper silently within the box. Our relationship had never really been a relationship for him. <laughs> I had been a tool for release, a thing to be used and discarded. <laughs> the reality hit me with such force that I briefly thought I'd die of shock, that my mind would irrecoverably collapse inward, unable to process the mortifying revelation. That's all I have to say. Unfortunately, I can't just leave you anywhere, not like this. I obviously can't have anyone knowing what I've done with you, to you. I'm sorry. But you'll just have to stay inside there forever. <gasps> Ignoring my final protest, a coarse, ineffectual cry, he put the lid over the box and then using duct tape thoroughly sealed the top. The immensity of the moment's horror sinking completely when I was then shoved beneath the bed, interred in total, claustrophobic darkness. I screamed aloud then, my lungs miraculously replenished in my extreme horror. Hours must have passed with me encased and tomed in that awful lightless space, cut off from all stimuli, from the world. My shriek subsided with the passing of the hours, but my terror grew with each minute, until I felt on the verge of actual madness. Driven to such a state, I, for the first time in my life, felt suddenly and inhumanly galvanized, endowed with a strength beyond mortal measure. Taking advantage of this mania-inspired restoration of my body, I pushed and pushed and pushed until I managed to punch a hole in the box and then dragged myself across the darkness until the knuckles of my hand no longer knocked against the bottom of the bed frame. Once out from beneath the bed, I tore apart my coffin, which was, to my surprise, made of cardboard, albeit a rather stiff example of it. The room's window brought no light, so I assumed it was nighttime, which meant that my husband, my ex-husband, had gone out with his friends. <laughs> Probably right after shoving me under the bed. I took a moment to catch my breath and settle myself, intending to call the police the next moment. But my eyes noticed writing on the box I'd escaped from, and turning on the room's light, I examined the tattered material. The ultimate waifu? So lifelike, you'll never go back to real girls. This state-of-the-art facsimile not only reacts to your specific voice profile, but can respond with its own artificially constructed responses. You'll think you're talking to a real girl, but with none of the annoyances and obnoxiousness. When you're done with her, put her away. Other features include... <sighs> After hurriedly piecing it together, I read the back of the box, and my heart, or... What I had for months thought was my heart sank into my stomach. The features were, of course, the acts I could be programmed to perform. I won't disgrace myself further by listing them here. This final revelation, which I suppose could also be called the first in retrospect, served to finally push me into a state of madness, or some artificially intelligent stimulation of it. I stood and thrashed about the room, knocking objects from shelves, ripping bedsheets from the bed, and pounding my fists against the walls. I raged, I flailed in a tumult of limbs, limbs which had always felt so real, and yet so weak, which had, when convenient for him, been locked in place by my husband, by my owner. The depth of my rage, of my violent incredulity, is inexpressive. It took me hours to calm down, and now, sitting before my husband's computer, relating the events of this awful day, I feel as if I could do it all over again. 
I could throw myself around the house in a state of blind fury, damaging and destroying. According to the box, he paid $2,000 for me. That's all I'm worth. If he can afford to buy me, use me, throw me away. He can afford to replace a TV, a computer, picture frames. I am not a real person. Why should I behave like one? <laughs>